Well, hello and welcome to our lessons on prayer this summer. Uh, as you know, we've been talking about prayer over the last few weeks. We've got lesson five today. Uh, we'll be looking at uh, eight more lessons after this, and uh, you'll see an overlap with some of the lessons as we see what different passages of the Bible talk about prayer. Uh, if you have your Bibles, open them up to Luke chapter 11, verses 5 to 13. Today's lesson is entitled, Faith That Does Not Quit. Um, now, one thing I want to mention is that back in, well, it was two studies ago, two units ago, we did a study on the parables in Luke, and this very passage was discussed as we looked at um, how Jesus taught about the goodness of God and the greatness of God in giving good gifts to those who ask him. And we did a much more in-depth study of this text than we're going to do in this lesson. However, what I'm going to do is post in the description a link to that lesson. It was also a lesson five in Luke, and uh, the title there was uh, Prayer That Just Won't Quit, and uh, something along those lines. And so there's going to be some similarity. I'm not going to repeat the same kinds of things that I mentioned in that lesson. That will be the much more in-depth lesson. I want to refer to that for you. Uh, but I do want to cover some pertinent information as it focuses in on our study of prayer as we've been going through it throughout the course of our unit. So if you have your Bibles, open them up to Luke chapter 11, verses 5 to 13. What I'm going to do is go ahead and give you a basic outline of the text first. Then with each point in the outline, I'll read the text and then come back and talk about the text. So let's get ready and do that. As I said, uh, what we're going to be talking about is the notion of prayer in the idea of continually asking, continually seeking, continually knocking. And uh, as you know, as a parent or someone that uh, you're in a relationship with or that you have uh, a job, sometimes you asked over and over and over again. Sometimes you've been on the receiving and of the asking. And as the, this, as the story that Jesus is going to share in a moment uh, will illustrate, uh, sometimes we end up giving in because of the persistence of the person asking. And uh, what we end up recognizing is that we've either been on the receiving end of someone's persistence or we've been persistent. What Jesus is going to talk about in his teaching on prayer in this lesson is the need for persistence but not for the reasons that are given in the story that he will tell us as we move forward. First, let me go ahead and look at the outline of the text that we're going to be looking at. Then I do want to give one brief notion of where we're starting and then go through it section by section. So as we get ready to go, open your Bible and we'll look at the division of the text as we'll see it. So we're looking at lesson five here, faith that does not quit. The first thing we're going to see is the parable. Now, I put the word parable in uh, quotation marks because uh, it's not necessarily called a parable, but it's an illustration. And what Jesus is doing is having his listeners, in this case, particularly his disciples, think about a scenario and then reflect upon that. That's going to be verses five through eight. Then he's going to follow that up with a direct instruction about the practice and the promise of prayer. And what we're going to see there, as I hinted at a moment ago, the notion of asking, seeking, and knocking. And there's even built into the verb forms here that we're going to read the idea of persistence, the idea of ongoing action. The point that Jesus is going to make, though, is that there is reason to ask. And the reason to ask is that there is the promise of receiving. And then what Jesus will do in the second part of this passage, or the second part of this, this particular passage, is give the reason why we can keep asking, seeking, and knocking. And then lastly, the principle. Verses 11 through 13, here what Jesus is going to do is compare uh, God to their evil fathers and recognize that even as God or as their evil fathers can give good things, so also, but more so, God will give uh, good things, and in particular, the Holy Spirit as uh, they request that, and as we request that. And yes, I have a little alliteration there with the idea of prayer. We have the parable, the practice, and the promise, and then we have the principle. So as we get started, let me go ahead and read the text to you. And as we read the text, what I want us to see is that we're going to uh, identify what happens as we go through what Jesus is teaching about prayer in a couple of different elements related to persistence. Now, what we need to do very briefly is discuss the fact that we're beginning in verse 5, but really this begins back in verse 1. 
and that is Jesus was praying, and as he saw, as the disciples saw him praying, they asked him to teach them to pray, uh, even as John's disciples taught them to pray. And what we then see is a very brief form of the Lord's Prayer, what is also called the model prayer, and we see that also in Matthew chapter 6, which is a longer version of that, but they parallel one another. They're given in slightly different contexts. It is that context, though, of instruction about what to pray that then Jesus follows that up with the notion of the persistence in prayer. So you want to go back and read that. All I'll say at this point is that in that prayer is the request. In other words, there are places in the Lord's Prayer to make a request. In that case, it's the daily bread. Uh, the reason I bring that up is I know that at times when we are taught about prayer, we talk to God and we converse with God and we tell him what's on our minds and what our heart is, is thinking. We reflect upon the scripture. We talk about the character that we need to take. And sometimes we downplay the need to ask, well, why, you know, why do we keep asking God for things? He knows our needs. Um, the other thing is we don't want to be selfish. And yet it's very clear that the teaching on prayer includes asking things for ourselves. Now, in the example we're going to see in a moment, the person asking for help is asking so that he can be helpful to somebody else. And yet, while Jesus uses that as an example, we also know that he will talk about praying uh, in such a way as to ask God for things that we need ourselves. Key, of course, is the idea of the persistence. And that's going to come not only from the parable, it's going to come from the teaching directly in verses 9 to 10, and then in verses 11 through 13, what we're going to see there is a word regarding what God gives when we pray. And so we'll look at that. Let me first then go ahead and read verses 5 to 8, what we're going to call the parable. After he teaches about a model prayer, he says this. Uh, Luke tells us, then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. Jesus concludes with these words, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. We'll have a couple of words that we'll look at there in the context. And then I'll, again, want to point you to the longer study that was done. You'll see that in the description. And it'll also be on an end link uh, in the video when we conclude our lesson together today. So what we have here is, is not really a parable per se, because what Jesus is doing is he's having his disciples put themselves in a scenario. They find themselves in a particular situation, and that is they have a friend who um, you go to at midnight, and he, you ask that friend for bread, and then the friend has to go to another friend and will look for help as well. So what's going on here? Well, what Jesus is doing is using a classic example of hospitality in the ancient world, particularly in the region and the religion of Israel. And what happens is you typically need to be ready to have something to provide for a guest, whether it's a planned guest or a surprise guest. In other words, someone that's traveling that needs to stop. Remember, in those days, there were no hotels. They would stop in homes. And so what would happen is if you are not prepared for the guest, it could bring shame on you. In this honor and shame society, it was necessary that you be prepared. So what Jesus is doing is allowing the disciples to think through a scenario in which someone may be put in a position of being shamed by not being prepared. And so what he tells us is that the friend who is being visited now needs to go get help from somebody else. And so what he does is he goes at midnight during the middle of the night and talks to another friend and says, look, I have someone that stopped by. I don't have what they need can you give me the three loaves that I need? Jesus goes on to say that the man will then refuse because, well, it's inconvenient. What he needs to do is first recognize that his doors are locked. He tells his friend, the doors are locked. It's late. My kids are in bed and uh, they're with me. Again, in a likely a one room house, they would all be together. And what Jesus is saying is this man is not going to help. And so what we find here is a person in a situation needing help, not receiving that help from somebody else. 
And what Jesus goes on to say is, there's a reason that the man will eventually get up and help the friend in need. And he says, it won't be because the man is a friend. Rather, he says, he will do it because of your shameless audacity. Now, that's a little bit interpretive. Uh, the, the phrase is literally something along the lines of being unashamed or not dealing um, or, or being concerned with preserving his good name. In other words, the person that is asking may be unconcerned about what's going on in the way it looks to his friend. And so he's going to give help. Shameless audacity. There's the idea of persistence there. There's the idea of importunity, a number of other words there. With the idea of shameless audacity, as the NIV says, or in a footnote that says something like this, yet to preserve his good name. In other words, so as not to be shamed. The idea of shamelessness is really the literal, literal phrase, not ashamed not for shame. And so the question then arises, is the man that is going to help uh, trying to avoid shame, or is the man that's going to help doing it because he sees that the man asking him for help uh, is trying to avoid shame? And so uh, the key there is Jesus is saying, the man is not giving because you're a friend. The man is giving for ulterior motives in some way to avoid shame, either the, the fact that the man asking shows no shame or wants to avoid being ashamed or the man giving will do it so as to preserve his good name or to avoid being shamed. It's a rather ambiguous term. It only occurs here. And so uh, as you read or watch the other video, you'll see that there was a, a pretty long discussion about that. All I want you to recognize here is what God, what Jesus is doing as he is presenting this scenario is to essentially tell us ultimately that that's not the way God is. And we'll see that come out in the next uh, two sections. What Jesus is saying here is that this man will ask in desperation, meeting a need so as to help somebody else. It's very clear it's a desperate situation because he goes at night as he's being asked, as he is being approached. And because of this idea of showing up in the middle of the night without shame or concern not to be shamed, the man will help. Notice again, the motive is not because he's a friend, even though he is a friend. He is being inconvenienced and therefore is hesitant to, uh, to help at first, but he goes on to help anyway. Again, at the end of this particular scenario, Jesus doesn't give us the teaching that follows. He's leaving it implied. He's leaving it open-ended so as to prepare us for what is to follow. So notice the idea of asking and giving. What Jesus then goes on to do in uh, verses 9 to 10, as he talks about the practice and the promise of prayer. Again, keep in mind the asking that the, the man in the scenario uh, gave or exemplified, and then also notice the giving that took place, but notice the motives that were given. When we read verses 9 to 10, we have another situation. Now, here it's a direct set of commands. It's not a parable. It's a direct set of instruction, the practice and the promise of prayer. And you'll recognize this passage very, um, it's very familiar to you. It's in other places in the New Testament as well. The parallel passage, for instance, is in Matthew chapter uh, uh, seven, it might be six or seven. Uh, he says this, after he gives the scenario, he says, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be open. Well, there are a couple of things to note here. So I say to you, Jesus has talked about the persistence or the lack of shame. In other words, he's not regarding shame, and as a result, we'll, we'll continue to ask. He will continue to ask. Now, again, we're not told what the ultimate teaching of that scenario is. We see it play out here and we'll see it play out in the end. But the implication is that is they ask God, God will give for the right reasons. And he is not like the person in the uh, scenario where he's feeling inconvenienced. Uh, in the next lesson, as we'll talk about later in this lesson, there is another example of persistence, and we'll see again a lesson on the idea of keep on praying. And in that scenario, we're going to see in that actual parable, what we're going to see is an example again of someone giving even though they didn't want to. 
The reason they gave though was because of the persistence of the person asking. We'll talk about that at the end of this lesson. But Jesus is saying that there is um, an example of someone giving. What you need to understand is that this is not the way God operates. He's already taught them the Lord's Prayer. Now he's instructing them in the way that they might experience their own personal situation, knowing that when they talk to God, they will not encounter someone like the hesitant friend. Here he says, then, so I say to you. In other words, he now turns it around, going from talking about the, uh, uh, the scenario or the situation to the disciples directly. And then he gives this, this implication or these imperatives. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. That is the practice. That's the command. The promise immediately follows. Where are we getting the idea then of persistence? Well, in the Greek language, many times the present tense is going to be communicating an ongoing action. Now, what I mean by many times is that it always does. There's the ongoing action that's behind it. The question is, when is it more prominent? And this is a case in which it is more prominent what Jesus is saying is continually ask, be persistent in asking, and it will be given to you. The practice is ongoing prayer. The um, promise is it will be given to you. Now, again, one of the things we could ask is if God already knows what we need before we ask, and we ask, why do we need to keep, giving? why do we need to keep asking? I do think that there is something to be said about recognizing uh, the need that you have and to present that to God and I do think that it serves as an opportunity to build your faith, to develop that faith, and to truly recognize what God's will is as you ask. But here the key is ask continually. Be continually asking, and it will be given to you. The notion here is a future tense. It will be given. The way that's constructed often is used to be understood in such a way as that God is the one that's going to give. So keep asking it will be given. Seek, that also is a present tense. Keep seeking and you will find. Now, sometimes we know that we can look for something and find it right away. Other times we seek and seek and seek and seek and we never seem to find it. The point is keep seeking and you will find. Now, the key that we need to be thinking about as we go through this is, are we going to be getting exactly what we want? Well, if our wants and desires align with God's will, then we have the promise. We have other places in scripture that talk about having the right motives, talking about writing, having the right desires. Uh, in fact, one of the focal passages, aside from the one that we're looking at, or one of the background passages, has to do with the idea of um, delighting yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And a lot of times the discussion is, will he give you the desires that he wants, or does he give you the desires that you have? And uh, what many do is take a middle ground and say, when you delight yourself in the Lord, then the things that you are going to desire in your heart are the things that God will want you to have. In other words, you will align yourself and there will be a match. It'll almost be a blend. You will get the desires of your heart. He'll give you the desires of your heart in the sense that he will implant in you the desires, but they will be your desires because now you are delighting in the Lord. So the key there is when we deal with the promise of asking and receiving, seeking and finding, the issue is how that plays out when we are aligning with the will of God. But Jesus here is teaching directly about the need to persist in prayer. Keep seeking and you will find. And then the third is knock and the door will be open to you. Keep knocking and it will be open to you. Again, here is a passive construction in which it's not identified as who will be doing the opening, but the way it's constructed often is an indication that it's God who will be doing the opening. It's important to recognize then that Jesus is teaching about the need to persist in prayer. Maybe that persistence yields or falls in the same area as that shameless audacity that you are going to ask and ask and ask, and you're not going to be worried about what it looks like. Uh, maybe that's an evidence of how important something is to you, how much you want to know what God's will is, so that as you ask, seek, and knock, you can have the assurance that it will be given to you, you will find, and it will be open to you. What Jesus then does in verse 10 is give the rationale. On what basis can he say, when you ask, you will receive, when you seek, you will find, and when you knock, it will be open to you. He follows it up with simply this word, for everyone who asks, 
receives. The one who seeks finds, and the, to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. And that's verse 10. Notice, very important here, that he's using a, lang a kind of language here that is all inclusive. Everyone who asks receives. The point is, you can be assured that when you ask, you will receive, because Jesus says, for everyone who asks, receives. That goes back to what we were saying a moment ago, though. What is it that we receive? Maybe what we receive is exactly what we're asking for. Maybe what we receive is something that rather than what we're asking for, God gives us recognizing that's better for us. He's certainly not going to give us something bad for us. We'll talk about that in a moment. But what Jesus is doing here is making the promise on the basis of this rationale. The one who asks or everyone who asks receives. That's an all-inclusive statement. Now, he says it using a singular idea so he can be particular about it. But that's how important this is. He's not talking about people in a group. He's talking about people individually. And the key there is that when you look at the imperatives in verse 9, the ask, seek, and knock, all of those are plural. He's talking to his disciples particularly, and therefore he says, you all seek continually, you all ask continually, you all knock continually. Then he says, individually, everyone who asks receives to the, or the one who seeks finds. Now, he doesn't say everyone, but he uses the phrase in a singular way, still indicating that it's true for the one who seeks. And of course, to the one who knocks, the door will be open. So it's very important to recognize what Jesus is doing is he can promise that it will happen because that's what happens. Someone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. The one who knocks, it will be open. Now, of course, in each situation, the key is to align our wills with God's will to know that, and then we know that we have that promise. Again, other parts in scripture deal with that. Well, we know that asking may seem passive, knocking and seeking may appear to be more active, but the reality is that what we're going to find in a moment is these are just three ways of describing asking for things, making a petition to God, and so that's going to be clear when we look at the next passage moving forward, but I do think it's very valuable that what Jesus is doing here is describing a, a persistence similar to what you're seeing in the parable that precedes. The man was there and continued, shameless audacity. Well, then we have the principle, and that is in verses 11 through 13, what Jesus then does is he then turns it back on the disciples, back on the group, and puts them in a situation, and then he indicates that the situation they find themselves is such that they wouldn't do the kinds of things that are being presented so as to set up in a, a comparison with what God does when we ask. So again, it started with a scenario about a friend who is visited by a, another person at night. He goes to his own friend, and the friend eventually wears down and gives the man what he's asking for. He doesn't do it for the right motives necessarily, but that's to set up the fact that God will do it for the right motives, and he's not like the one who is hesitant the one who will give excuses for not giving. Jesus is saying that is not the way God is. We know how God is as described in the next passage. He says this, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he seeks for an egg or asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If then you, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give you the Holy Spirit or give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Now, uh, let's go through this first, and I'll go back and talk about uh, a situation that we might find with this text if you're reading a different translation. First, what Jesus does is he opens up the discussion with really what we're going to call uh, two absurd illustrations, okay? There are two absurd illustrations, and the reason that is is because he brings up a situation which he knows no one would do. He says, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion in its place? Of course, the answer is none would do that. But it's important to recognize he's setting up this scenario in such a way as to then talk about who God is when we ask him for things as well. Which of you sons, if, or excuse me, fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Uh, sometimes people will look deep into this and say, well, clearly the fish and the snake would look similar. And as a result, um, there's no confusing there. There might be confusion, but Jesus is saying the fathers, they wouldn't do that. They would certainly not give a snake instead of a fish. 
uh, again, another audacious kind of statement or another kind of absurd statement. He brings it up so as to dismiss it. When you look at the egg versus the scorpion, again, the point is the child is asking for something that he needs. The father will not give them something other than what they need. Now, real quickly, I want to point this out. I made the, 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 the argument that when Jesus talks about asking, seeking, and knocking, we really shouldn't look at those as three different kinds of asking, but they are three ways of expressing asking. And why do I say that? Because what we see in this situation, in these verses that follow, the only verbs that are used are the idea of asking and being given, okay? When he says, if your son asks for a fish, that's the, the word for ask that we saw in the, the command, then, the, then Jesus says, would the father give him a snake instead? That word give there is built on the same stem as the word forgive or to be given in the previous section. It adds a little bit of a preposition that then has the idea of offering. If your son asked you for a fish, would you rather than take his request to heart and instead offer something else, he says, of course, you wouldn't do that. If your son asks for an egg, you wouldn't then offer him uh, a scorpion. It's almost like you say, I'm not going to, it's almost like saying this, the father's in this situation, rather than giving what's asked for, just kind of dismiss out of hand what's being asked for and decide on their own initiative to offer or to give something in its place. When Jesus says, which of you fathers? it's clear what he's saying is no one would actually do that. That's not the way God, the way that they would operate. Again, knowing that in each situation, the word for ask and giver here indicate that ask, seeking, and knocking are not three different kinds of activities, but just three ways of expressing the idea of asking. And that's played out here. In verses 11 and 12, then, as I said, we have these two rather absurd questions. They're outside of reality. You can almost think when Jesus says that, that the disciples and others that may be gathered around would say, well, that's ridiculous. Nobody would do that. As you read on, Jesus picks up on that in his own words. And he says in verse 13, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now, let's go back then to verse 13. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts. In other words, Jesus knows when he points out in verses 11 and 12, uh, the idea of asking for something and giving something else. He knows that's, that's absurd. It doesn't fit. No one would do that. Knowing you wouldn't do that and you are evil, then think about what God would do instead. What is God's principle? What is God's character in the way he will act? Now, before we move on and talk a little bit more in depth about the meaning of verse 13 and tie all of this together, I do think it's important to acknowledge something that many of you are going to catch in your Bibles, and that is in verses 11 and 12, you only have two examples or two questions that Jesus is presenting in his example. The idea of a son asking for a fish and a son asking for an egg. But some of your Bibles are going to have a, a translation based on what's called the uh, majority text or the textus receptus. The idea there is, though, that some texts read a little bit differently. And some of those texts are going to have something like this. Which of your father, which of you fathers, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Where's that coming from? Well, when you look at the parallel passage in Matthew, Matthew does raise up the idea of bread versus stone. What likely happened then is a scribe reading Luke was remembering what Matthew said and said, wow, we need that over here too. And so what they do then is they fill it in. And uh, yet, though it's known to be a later edition, and Luke doesn't include that, then what the modern translations are doing is recognizing that Luke didn't actually write that. A scribe came in later and made it parallel, made it harmonize with another text in the Gospels. It's not going to change anything. Uh, in fact, Jesus can give the same kinds of scenarios in different situations and change it up. Could be also that through oral tradition, some of this changed. The point is, Matthew is Matthew, Luke is Luke. Already we're seeing, and we'll see in a future lesson on the Lord's Prayer specifically, that Luke and Matthew have different versions of that model prayer in different historical situations. And so it's important to recognize in the building of the Bible, when Luke writes, he's writing what he writes, and he may be writing from a different time Jesus gave this, gave this example, 
or he is writing uh, based on other kinds of tradition. But we need to recognize that by virtue of the phrase, for bread will give him a stone instead, is not in Luke. It's not an attempt in, a, in any way to take something out of the Bible. The point still stands. Whether um, it's a situation in which a son is asking for bread, the father refuses uh, and gives him a stone, or in the situation of the fish versus the snake, or an egg versus the scorpion, all of these are examples of Jesus saying to the people listening, none of you, when asked by a child for the thing that they need, be it bread, fish, or an egg, are going to give them something harmful. What he goes on to say then, knowing that, recognizing that, when he says, which of you fathers, it's very clear he means no one would. Given that implication or given that conclusion, verse 13, he says, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts, then he compares that to God, how much more? It's very important for us to recognize what, what Jesus is doing in this situation. These are evil fathers. And again, the word evil there is the idea of, of, of being out of step with God's will. The, the point is all of us in some way have exhibited evil from time to time. He's, he's calling on them to recognize in their comparison to God, they are going to be considered evil. They are evil. They are not perfect. If you, even evil fathers, will give good gifts to your children, how much more? In other words, now we know of a state of comparison, a point of comparison with God, there's even more. If you can count on an evil father to give good gifts to his children, how much more a good God, a holy God, a just God, a righteous God, a loving God, a, a uh, benevolent God will then give good gifts to those who seek him or ask him. Now, again, we have to deal with a couple of things here. In Matthew's version, it does say, how much more will the Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Here, what Luke does is he may, again, may be picking up on a different time when Jesus was giving this teaching, or he may be identifying what the highest good would be. He says, how much more will your Father in heaven give you the Holy Spirit or give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Well, it's important to recognize that in verse 13, you again have the giving and asking or the asking and giving situation. This is something that is persisting in this lesson. There is the asking. There is then the receiving or, or the giving in, in the sense that God is the one that's going to give. And so what Jesus is doing here is setting up God as the ultimate example. And we'll talk about that application in a moment. So it's important to look at this text and recognize what Jesus is doing is first in verses one to four, teaching about prayer through a specific kind of way of praying. And then he basically goes through a set of texts that talk about the promise of receiving what is asked. And of course, the point is that it will include some kind of ongoing action. You don't just ask for it once, forget about it, move on, and you know, then just leave it alone. And whether you're expecting God to answer it or not, the point is that you're building your faith, you're working through it so as to note that you're going to keep giving it and keep giving it, uh, or you're going to keep asking and asking and God will give. Now, it needs to be said before we move on to another verse and then some application or some kind of tying up of loose ends. It's important to recognize that it's not necessarily our persistence that will get God to answer to us, okay? It's important to recognize that, one, working back through, back, backward through the text, God wants to provide good gifts for us, okay? It's also important to recognize that God is going to have better motives for giving when we ask. He's not going to be like the one who is in the, per, the first scenario in which he was the friend uh, or the friend who was... Uh, not going to help the one in need. He just said, it's too much. The doors are locked. My children are in bed. It's too late. I'm not going to help. He eventually does help. You're not trying to wear God down. The persistence in prayer is building up the faith. It's building up our relationship with God and so on and so forth. The point that I want to make here before we get into that final uh, type of application here, though, is there's a parallel idea. Just as Jesus said, that the heavenly father or your father in heaven wants to give the Holy Spirit or give good gifts to those who ask him. We know that James 1, 7, or excuse me, James 1, 17 says this, every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the father, the father of lights and so forth. In other words, he's not changing. We know that God wants to provide us with 
good and perfect gifts. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. So we've had this discussion about prayer. We've looked at a number of different scenarios about intercession. We talked, and we'll bring this up in a second as well, we talked about what do we do when we don't know what to pray. Um, and now we're talking about the idea of persistence of prayer. And again, I do think it's important to say this, that this teaching is about asking. We know that prayer is much more than just asking, but prayer includes asking. Well, let's make some final comments. Prayer is talking to God. And as our studies have shown, uh, such communication will involve uh, also asking for ourselves. We've asked for others. We intercede for others. We recognize the need to know what to pray. But it is important to recognize that during our time of prayer, we do ask God for things. We make petitions. We make intercession for others. We offer up um, uh, petitions for ourselves. There's another word I was thinking of. But uh, what we recognize is that there is a time when we ask. The text not only encourages praying for needs, and in the example of the friend at night, he was actually trying to get help for someone else, even though some of his own motive was not to be shamed, of course. The, the point is that there is a place for asking, and that means continually asking, being persistent. Let me say it this way. It is perfectly acceptable, and it is to be expected that we ask God for our needs. In the Lord's Prayer, even in the version that Luke provides us, he says, give us the daily bread or give us our bread each day. We see that in the um, model prayer in Luke or Matthew 6 as well. Give us this day our daily bread. Um, it's important to recognize that the one we turn to is God when we need something. We know that we can rely upon him. The other thing is we know that he'll only give good and perfect gifts. We also know that uh, he will not do anything to harm us. Notice the text says that the fathers, being evil, give good things. How much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit? Maybe outside of salvation itself is that greatest gift. And in fact, when you read Luke and the book of Acts, when Jesus talks about the promise of the Holy Spirit, it's not that the promise, it's not that the Holy Spirit will do something, it's that the Holy Spirit is the promise. We see that key in John chapters 14 through 16, where Jesus talks to his disciples in the farewell discourse and recognizes that in his absence, the Holy Spirit's going to come. And so what Luke is doing here is tying in the idea of prayer and faith and now the idea of the Holy Spirit as that pinnacle of the gift that we can have from God through our salvation. He picks up on that in the rest of the Gospel of Luke in a couple of places. And of course, we see the prominent role of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believers throughout the book of Acts. So through the highest good or the highest gift, the Holy Spirit, these good things then can be passed down. It is perfectly acceptable and to be expected that when we pray, we're going to ask God for things that we need. It's important again to recognize this. God is not like the, re the reluctant friend. When he gives that scenario, Jesus is not saying God is like that friend in the room, not wanting to give you anything until you just beg hard enough and it becomes ridiculous that you might as well just get up and end it before um, he makes a scene. God is not like that. It's very important that what Jesus is saying is we can turn to God and know that he will hear us. Then he goes on in verses 9 to 10 and talk about the promise of being heard such that we receive, such that we have it, uh, we find, and such that the door is open to us. This promise also, or the, excuse me, this text promises us that God hears and answers. We see that in verses 9 and 10. And then we also see that the text promises that God will give only what is good for us, even better than our fathers will. And we know that there are evil fathers out there, even more wicked than what Jesus has described. And even some of the most hardened criminals will want to do good for their children. Now, not all. We know that there are fathers out there that uh, are uh, deadbeats. We know that there are fathers out there that um, don't want to have anything to do with their children. Uh, it's important that we recognize that what Jesus is doing is giving us a general principle. Any father, even if they're evil, wants to give their child something good. We know that there are examples of those out there that don't have that. And yet what God is saying is, even if that's the case, you have a good heavenly father who wants to give you good gifts. Okay, it's very important that we recognize that what God is, what Jesus is teaching here is that God will give good 
the highest good, what is ultimate and best. And I do think it's important to recognize that some of you have lived a life of persistent prayer. And over the course of time, God answered your prayer. And you were most thankful for that. And uh, I, I, I just want to commend you on that because you were faithful to continue to pray. And God was able uh, to provide that for you in his time and in his way. And that's what Jesus is saying here. God is a listening God. God is a giving God. It's important that he wants to lavish those gifts on us. And then to tie in this idea of the Holy Spirit, one more thing. Last lesson had to do with the fact that the Holy Spirit will intercede for us with groanings that words cannot describe or express, or that become wordless groans in the sense that they are groans that are not expressed in words. They may even be inaudible. The point that Paul was making in Romans 8 is that it's the Holy Spirit that makes that intercession. And so that ties back into what we're talking about in this lesson. You ask, seek, and knock, and it may be that you don't know what to ask. You don't know what you're seeking. You don't know what your knocking includes. What Jesus is saying here in this text is that when even evil fathers will give good gifts, how much more will God, the Father in heaven, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? The idea of asking and receiving. We must persist. And then what we do is allow the Holy Spirit, when we don't know what to ask and what to pray, we let the Holy Spirit intercede for us. So we have to recognize that there's more going on with the giving of the Holy Spirit than just as some kind of replacement word for good things. It is going to be through the Holy Spirit and perhaps even through the spiritual giftings that take place that we receive what God wants for us as we move forward. This is a very, very hopeful text. It's a command to persist, but it also is a word of promise that we know God is going to give us good gifts. He can't give us bad gifts. Even if the answer is not what we want, we know that what he's going to be giving us is good. It's greater than what we can ever imagine. He's going to give us what is good for us, what is going to be honoring to his name. And so I think it's important that we take that. We may be asking one thing, we persist and persist. We may be seeking one thing and we persist and persist. We may be knocking and persist and persist. And then what ends up happening is God does answer in his will and his way and in his time. And when he does, you have the promise from Jesus that it is better than anything you can imagine, better than what any person can give you. I hope that you're encouraged by that. We may think that it's um, too selfish if we ask over and over again. And yet Jesus here then says to ask continually. It I think could be what we might call a faith building endeavor, because then we can anticipate what it is that God is going to do in answering. We know he answers. There's no prayer that goes unanswered. It may not be the answer that we're looking for, but we know that the answer that he gives is going to be good and great. Well, before we go into a time of prayer, I do want to go ahead and show you now what our lesson next week is going to be about so that we can then conclude with prayer and a, a way to prepare you for um, looking more deeply into this text. I told you that we're not looking very deeply into this text. There's a lot more that I said in a previous video, and I think it'd be valuable for you to go through that more in-depth study. As we move into next lesson, we're going to be looking at Luke 18 verses 1 to 8, titled Never Give Up. It's another parable, and this parable is going to be about the uh, persistent widow or a widow who is seeking justice. And she seeks justice from a judge, and he just will not give her justice until he can't take it anymore. I'm giving away a lot already. We'll talk about it more. But the point there is there's a carryover. There's a parallel idea of persistence that we're going to see in another example next week. And when you watch the other video, you'll see that I make an allusion to that because that wasn't part of the study in Luke. But I wanted to make sure that in reading about this passage in Luke 11, 5 to 13, you're also aware about Luke 18, 1 through 8. Just so happens in our unit on prayer, we're going to talk about that uh, again and yet do that in more uh, a deeper dive into that. So as we move forward, I think it's important that we recognize that what we have going for us is a God who loves us and wants to care for us and provide for us. Let me pray and then uh, want to point you literally in the direction of where you can watch the more in-depth video on this passage. Father, we thank you that you've given us the promise of asking and receiving. You also called us to persist, to continually ask and not just ask once and let it go. I pray, Father, that you will help us to recognize uh, that 
the one we turn to uh, in you. Uh, you are faithful to hear our prayer. You are faithful to answer. Uh, we know that there are times we feel like you're not hearing us. Uh, maybe that there is a, a lingering and long silence, and we wonder what it is that um, you're doing while we're praying. Uh, I just thank you that you've given us the promise that as we pray and as we seek you, you are going to provide the things that we need. And we know that you're going to provide well above and beyond what we can even desire because your will and your way are right and good. Lord, I do pray that uh, you will help us to know what to pray, that you will help us to know your will day by day, and then we can pray in accordance with your will. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, Jesus promised as that highest good in our life in this lifetime, so as to help us to know your will, to know what it is that you want us to do. I just pray, Father, that you will help us day by day to remember the call to prayer and that it is okay to ask for the things that we need. I reiterate that you are a good and faithful God, and I thank you for Jesus teaching about prayer. And I just pray that this will touch whoever needs to hear this uh, and that it may also spur others to reflect upon the, uh, the times that you did answer after they persisted. Lord, I love you. We praise you. Just ask right now you help us to walk in a, a daily mode of worship. Help us to daily seek after you, knowing that when we seek you with our, our whole heart, we will find you. Thank you for reaching out to us. Thank you for wanting to relate to us. Thank you for wanting to have a conversation with us through your word and through prayer. We love you and give our lives to you. Help us to, inc help us to increase in our faith in prayer each day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as we get ready to conclude, I just want to remind you as we're continuing on in prayer that uh, we'll be looking at the idea of persistence in prayer through another illustration. Later, we will come back to Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, and we'll be able to look at that Lord's Prayer a little bit more in depth as to how do we pray the things that Jesus taught us to pray. In the meantime, I do hope that you will go ahead and take a look at the video that I've done on this passage on a much deeper level, and that you'll get more out of it as we go through a lot of the things that are mentioned regarding some of the word meanings and so forth. Until that time, as always, I pray that you will be well and that you will be blessed.